Welcome. We're so glad you're here with us for today's Harper Lecture. The Harper Lecture series began in 1979 with Hannah Holborn Gray speaking in San Francisco. As the need for critical thought remains apparent in all areas of life, we proudly continue this signature program to bring you stimulating conversations and fresh ideas. Our UChicago community is a global one, and we are thrilled that technology can help us stay connected to one another. As you enjoy today's lecture, please note the following items. Your camera and video will be off. However, we encourage you to ask questions. Please use the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen to ask a question at any time during the talk. Closed captions are available by clicking the box at the bottom of your screen. Click Show Subtitles to enable this feature. If you're having trouble with audio or video, please try shutting down programs in the background, or you can dial in from your phone. Thank you once more for joining us. We couldn't do this without you. Welcome to today's Harper Lecture. Only three left at this price. Investigating Dark Patterns and Consumer Protections with Professor Marshini Chetty. I'm Matthew Spurgeon, a 2004 graduate of the Master's Program in Social Sciences. I have the honor of serving as a member of UChicago's university-wide alumni board, in addition to being an active volunteer in the university community. It is my great pleasure to welcome you to our virtual Harper Lecture as we at the University of Chicago continue the tradition of the relentless pursuit of knowledge, critical thought, and other life of the mind. Please allow me to introduce our moderator, Katie Bailey, AB10, PhD 15. She will join the conversation following Professor Shetty's presentation to help guide us through the Q&A portion of the program. This evening, we are delighted to have Dr. Marshini Chetty, Assistant Professor in the Department of Computer Science at the University of Chicago, where she directs the Amioli Internet Research Laboratory. Professor Chetty specializes in human-computer interaction, usable privacy and security, and ubiquitous computing. She designs, implements, and evaluates technologies to help users manage different aspects of internet use, from privacy and security to performance and costs. She often works in resource-constrained settings and uses her work to help inform internet policy. We look forward to opening the floor to audience questions later in the program. But for now, please join me in welcoming Professor Chetty to the virtual stage. Thank you, Matthew, for that introduction. Um, let's just uh, dive straight in to the presentation. Okay, so um, thank you so much for you know, attending the talk today. I'm going to, as Matthew was saying, speak to you about dark patterns and consumer protections. So I am in the Department of Computer Science and I run the ALAB um, with a host of amazing students. And I just wanna say that my students and I, we love the internet. I love the internet and how it's connecting us right now, how we're able to have this talk. I love how it allows me to communicate with my family, get work done, entertain myself and so on. And so in my lab, we really focused on the internet specifically. And really, you know, my students and I, we want the internet to be more trustworthy and inclusive. And today, I'm going to tell you a bit more about how I do this before I tell you what I mean by trustworthy. So the kind of research I do involves a lot of user studies, so studying people like yourself, um, collecting data from the internet, creating tools to help users like yourself, and then also uh, the main goal that we have is to actually impact consumer protection policy online. So I use a process called user-centered design, where again, the user is at the center of what all of the research that we do, where we try to find out what user needs are, we design and prototype solutions, sometimes we implement these, and often we evaluate them to learn more about the people that we're trying to design for. We're informed by lots of different kinds of theories, like theories of privacy, theories of learning, and so on. Now, I mentioned I want the internet to be trustworthy, but why? Well, if you've looked through the pandemic or where we are right now in the pandemic, I'm sure you've seen that there's a lot of misleading online content. In fact, up until recently, Twitter was labeling misleading content. And so you may have seen labels like this one online on Twitter and other social media platforms and thought, hey, maybe there is information that I can't necessarily trust when I see it. Sometimes when we're trying to buy stuff, whether it's in the Black Friday sale or upcoming Christmas shopping, we might have sites where it's kind of easier to make one choice over another. 
Like in this interface, the sign up button is really easy to see and perhaps easier to click. Or even when we're looking on social media, sometimes we may see things that could be misleading. For example, um, in 2018, Truth in Advertising actually went after DJ Khaled because on Instagram, he was posting a lot of posts that showed him with a brand of alcohol. And they noted that this was not really uh, right because he has a lot of young followers and he wasn't disclosing that this was actually a sponsored post. And so I actually saw that more recently, He's been, uh, you know, they've been messaging him again because he, you know, they think he's doing similar things again. So because there's this untrustworthy content, we really need research to help inform internet policies. And we need tools to help users critically evaluate these kinds of content to protect from online malfeasance. So my work tries to make the internet more trustworthy by identifying different kinds of misleading online content creating tools to help users evaluate this content and understanding users' privacy and security behaviors on the internet more generally. So sadly, I don't have time to tell you about all the things that I'm excited to do research in. And instead, I'm going to just focus on one type of investigation, and that is specifically investigating dark patterns. And I'll start off by talking about dark patterns that we found in online shopping. So if you're actually still in Chicago, you'll know that it's very, very cold out here. Or maybe you remember that when you were here. And I was thinking, you know, since the winter break's coming up, maybe I should book a flight to somewhere warmer, maybe Key West in Florida. Oh, I started looking at flights, noticed that maybe I could leave next Friday, classes will be over, um, stay for two weeks and come back. And I noticed that Whenever I search for flights, they say things like, there are only three tickets left at this price. And I often wonder, maybe you have two, is that true? You know, is this a dark pattern? What if it's just an accurate low stock count? Maybe there really are only three tickets. And if I don't buy one now, I won't get to have my warm vacation. Or, hey, aren't airline tickets just kind of complicated? Don't they oversell tickets? What does this really mean? But really, how do we actually know if an interface online is deceptive or if it's affecting a consumer negatively? Or in my case, trying to get me to just buy that ticket to Florida. So what are dark patterns? Dark patterns are basically in um, Harry Brignall's words, he's a user is experienced designer in the UK. They're tricks used in websites and apps that make you do things that you didn't mean to, like buy a ticket to Key West, or buying or signing up for something. More broadly, dark patterns are basically user interface design choices that benefit an online service provider by coercing, steering, or sometimes deceiving you into making choices that maybe you may not have otherwise made if you were more fully informed. Now, there are many different definitions of dark patterns. And again, I won't have time to go into all the different definitions, but I do want to just say something more generally about how this kind of comes about. So you may have heard of something called choice architecture by some other folks who used to be at UChicago. Um, they wrote a book called Sludge and Sunstone and Thaler talked about how really anything we put in an interface kind of falls under this choice architecture, right? Just like what you're seeing on the screen now. Usually there's some visuals, there's an order in which things are presented, what is presented to you, all of that is actually designed, right? Designers are kind of choice architects. They decide which choices to present to you, what kind of information you're going to be shown, and they may even exert some pressure to direct you to certain choices over others. Now, dark patterns are basically just exactly that. There are patterns where choices have been manipulated in some way, try to steer you in one direction over another. So let's look at an example. Maybe you've seen these cookie consent notifications, like this site uses cookie, you know, and maybe you have to say got it or accept. Now, are these dark patterns? Well, I would say yes, because dark patterns have lots of different attributes. And I won't go through all of these in detail, but typically they're manipulating some sort of information. Sometimes they're deceiving you or they're hiding information, or they're modifying the choices that you have. So they might make one choice more clear than another choice, or 
they may not give you many choices at all and kind of restrict what you can see. So let's take a look at that example again. Well, we can see that in these cookie consent notifications, information is being hidden. If I want to see more about the decline choice, I have to click on view cookie statement or please visit our privacy policy. Also, the accept button is very visually appealing. I can easily find it and click on it. And more obviously, how do I say no? What if I don't want to accept these cookies? You know, um, it's very hard for me to do that and figure out how do I actually get out of this? And so this is one example of a dark pattern. And you might be thinking, well, hang on a second. Isn't just this, you know, isn't this just the same as real life marketing? I mean, isn't this just like me walking past a store where there's a closing down sale and everything is, you know, discounted? Or perhaps it's like when I go into Target and see the candy bars um, as I'm lining up in the checkout. And I'd say, oops, <laughs> I'd say um, it's a little bit different because uh, when I'm in Target and I can see the candy bars there, you know, I could see if there's only one left. And with an online service provider, they may know a lot of information about me and everyone else who shops there. And they might just present me with the exact candy bar that's my favorite, right? And they also do this on a much larger scale. Also, I don't actually know, does United have three tickets to Key West? Or is that just something that they're saying? So there's not an equal amount of information in real life as there is online. And that's what makes dark patterns a little bit more insidious. But now, is this actually a problem? Are dark patterns really prevalent online today? And here's where my research comes in. So what we decided to do was, given that there were only these anecdotal examples that Harry Brignall and many others had brought together all the kinds of dark patterns they had experienced from being on the internet, we wanted to see if this was actually prevalent. And we decided to do this in a place where people have to make decisions to buy stuff like in shopping. So what we did was we gathered a big data set from 11,000 of the most popular shopping websites worldwide. And we had three key challenges. So the first challenge we had was mimicking a real user browsing websites. And so, um, and then we had to actually collect and store data from all of these shopping websites. And finally, we had to find some way to analyze and store this collected data. So to mimic a real user browsing websites, we created a shopping bot. So imagine our bot going to something like Macy's, checking out the shoes, and deciding, you know, clicking through, trying out different options, maybe black shoes, trying out different sizes, and then clicking something like add to bag, and then finally clicking again and getting to the shopping cart. So this is essentially what our automated shopping bot did. And unfortunately, we didn't buy a ton of shoes from Macy's or any of the other 11,000 shopping websites. We stopped at this point. And at every point along the way, we took screenshots and grabbed all the data and all the information about every page that we visited. The next challenge was actually deciding how to analyze this data. So for this, what we did was we took each of these product pages that we collected data from, like here's a product page for Macy's for um, some boots. And we split all the different pages, uh, uh, all the different pieces of the pages into little bits, right? So taking everything like the review section, the quantities and all of these things into little segments. And then to analyze the data, we took all of those segments and we put all of the like segments together. Think of putting all of the things that are very similar to each other in a bucket. And then we looked at all the different buckets using machine learning to try to see, are there any patterns in here? Is there anything problematic that we can see in any of these buckets? And what are these buckets related to? And what we found was that even though we were not able to crawl every single page on all of these 11,000 shopping websites, in the pages that we did crawl as a lower bound, 11% of those shopping websites had some sort of dark pattern. And what I'm going to do now is give you some examples of what we found. So we found seven categories of dark patterns. I'm not going to go through all of them. I'm just gonna discuss four categories with you and give you some examples. 
So the first dark pattern is something that we call sneaking, where a service provider is trying to sneak something into your basket, right? So perhaps you're shopping and they're just trying to sneak something in there. So maybe hoping that you won't notice it and then sort of add it to your cart and purchase it. So in this case, you can see here on the left, there's a greeting card service and what's been um, put in the basket is, you know, up until this point, the person was just selecting a bunch of flowers. And then just when they're about to check out, you know, this greeting card service has just been added on with the additional cost. And it's similar on the right. So we found this across different websites. And maybe this is something that you've noticed in some of the sites you've visited. Another dark pattern we found is something that we call urgency. This is where it's trying to create some pressure on the user so that they feel like they really have to act now. And the first one, which maybe you saw on Black Friday, are these timers, right? So we saw many shopping websites have timers on them where you, know, you can't get in on that deal because the timer is going to expire uh, unless you, know, before the, you have to get in on the deal before the timer expires. So here are some examples where it says, you know, the offer ends in 59 uh, minutes, 48 seconds. And then similarly on the right, this is talking about an offer expiring. Now, interestingly, we also in our research visited these websites to see what happens when the timer does expire. And in many of the cases, we saw that this was outright deceptive. Even when the timer expired in some of the cases, it just reset and nothing else happened. Or the time expired and the deal was still valid. The second type of urgency that online platforms um, in the shopping domain use is limited time offers. So this is very similar where um, providers say, you know, the price includes $200 of instant savings, 40% off, limited time only. And the same as sale ends soon. But notice it doesn't say, well, what is this limited time period? Well, when does the sale end? And so with this ambiguity, again, it's unclear if you should act now or if you should wait. One other dark pattern that we found is something called misdirection. So this is where the online service provider is trying to get you to pay attention to the thing that they want you to pay attention to, right? And here, um, there's one kind of misdirection that we found, which is called confirm shaming. This is kind of where you're given an asymmetric choice and the language for decline is worded in such a way as to shame you into clicking the accept button. So for example, on the left, would you like 15% off your purchase? It's very easy to say, yes, I'd like the discount instead of no thanks, I like full, um, full price. And similarly on the right, you know, to actually decline an offer, you have to say, no thanks, I'd rather join the pay full price for things club. And who wants to do that? Similarly, another type of misdirection we saw is what we call trick questions. So typically, many of us often would associate that if we have a checkbox online, when we check the box, we're opting into something. And when we uncheck it, we opt out. So trick questions come into play where there are these checkboxes, except it doesn't sort of interact in the way that you expect. So in this case, it says, We'd love to send you emails with offers and new products from New Balance Athletics, but if you do not wish to receive these updates, please tick the box. Now, because this doesn't match our mental model of what's going on, people may be tricked into doing the thing that they actually wanted to do the opposite to. The final dark pattern that I'll mention is something called social proof. Here, people are given kind of activity notifications so that they feel like you know, again, maybe there's a scarce quantity that they're looking at, or they want to jump on the bandwagon and get the same product that everyone else is enjoying. So you may have seen notices like this, where it might say something like Jacqueline from Jacksonville just saved $52 on her order, or 28 people have viewed this in the last 24 hours. Now, not only did we see the social proof on online shopping websites, again, in many of the cases, we found outright deception. So this Jacqueline from Jacksonville social proof message is from a site called threadup.com. And at the time we did the study, we saw that all threadup.com was doing was pulling from two lists, a list of names and a list of places. And it could have easily just said, 
Caitlin from Chicago just saved $52 on her order. Now, not only are there dark patterns online, our research also uncovered that in many cases, like for example, there's a platform called Shopify where if you want to create an online shop, you can easily set up this online shopping experience with the Shopify platform. And we saw that there are many third party plugins where you can easily plug in different ways to have dark patterns on your site to actually enable you to do things like have that urgency or pressured selling or even create um, limited stock counts and so on, something we call scarcity. So not only are there dark patterns, but there's almost a business behind this where there are lots of people that are enabling these notifications and these kinds of messages or interface choices uh, you know, to make money essentially. So if you want to find out more about the other kinds of dark patterns that we found, you can go and look at our repository, which is um, available at this web address. But I want you to take away the following things. First, dark patterns are prevalent in shopping, but not only in shopping. In fact, other researchers have shown that their prevalence um, of dark patterns in consent notifications, like I showed you earlier, in interfaces um, related to privacy, to give, you know, help you give up your data more easily, and even in mobile applications, to mention a few. And so now that we've talked about online shopping, I thought I'd also throw in a little bit of um, a different uh, domain where dark patterns exist, which is social media. So now I want to talk about dark patterns um, that we found in the social media context. So this is a funny article that came out earlier this year where um, the New Yorker put up this satirical piece saying, Elon Musk deletes every Twitter account but his own. And it was really funny. It said, you know, in an official statement, Musk said he deleted everyone else's accounts to address the number one problem plaguing Twitter, the relentless flood of voices inferior to his own. Now, of course, this was a joke, and we all know Twitter's been in turmoil recently, but it did get us thinking and um, was related to some research that we were doing, which was, well, how do you delete your social media account? How do you delete your Twitter account or Facebook or Instagram, or whatever your Facebook social media account is? And what we wanted to specifically answer is, how easy is it to delete a social media account? And are there dark patterns being employed in this process to keep users on the platform? And so we created. Um, we did this research, which again, you know, I'm happy to send you the paper for this, where we faced the three challenges that we faced in the earlier work again. So unlike the earlier work, we weren't able to automatically collect the deletion options on all social media platforms because every social media platform has the deletion options in a different place and has a different interface. It's not like everyone has a shopping cart where we know where to go and scrape. And then we also had to collect this data, but we had to do this much more manually. Um, in this case, we actually had to collect screenshots manually. And then we also analyzed and um, stored this data. So we created and uh, did a two-part study. In the first part, we decided to analyze what are the steps to delete your account. And so we created and then deleted accounts on the top 20 social media sites in the United States. And uh, we did this with fresh accounts. So in other words, we did not, um, you know, we didn't create accounts and then build up a whole history and so on. So our accounts were just created and then deleted very shortly afterwards. And of course, during this process, instead of an automated shopping bot taking all the pictures, we actually had students helping us to take the screenshots of every single point of that process. Oops, let me get my mouse. So specifically, how did we figure out what social media is? It turns out it's not that easy. We used a definition where basically social media is defined as a platform that's used to create, modify, share, and discuss internet content. So that means, broadly speaking, not only are platforms that you would expect, like Twitter and YouTube on there or Pinterest, but other platforms like GitHub, which is for sharing code and creating um, software repositories, also fits under this definition. So what we found out is that account deletion is not always possible or even a simple process. And in fact, there are many different words that are used for account deletion, like deactivate or hibernate or delete or close. 
And we group them into three different options, which are close, delete after closing, and delete immediately. And on some accounts or some social media uh, platforms, you can't really make it so that your account cannot be recovered. In fact, on Etsy and Slack, it's very difficult to permanently delete your account. So here are the different types of options that we found where we just named them as close, um, delete after closing, and delete immediately. But the actual naming depends on the social media platform. So on Etsy, you can close your account. So this means that nothing that you had in that account disappears. You can reopen this account at any time. And it's not that it's unrecoverable. Note here, you can permanently delete your account on Etsy, but it is very difficult. Um, delete after closing is usually when a social media provider says something like, you have 30 days to reactivate your account and cancel deletion, but after 30 days or some waiting period, then your account will be deleted. And this occurred on Facebook, um, this example. And then finally, the kind of um, last option that people have is delete immediately. So here, um, this is one example where it's just, you know, you get a confirmation screen and it's delete everything and that's it. You cannot go back. Now, in doing this process, we saw that there are restricted options here with regards to deletion. And in particular, from mobile apps. So only 12 of the 20 platforms that we looked at offered deletion from both a mobile app and a desktop and a mobile browser. And and that's even though you can create mobile um, accounts on mobile apps, that's kind of surprising because you can't always delete that same account from a mobile app. So eight out of 20 offered only one way of creating or deleting an account, um, and the majority were based on the desktop. So this may not seem problematic, but if you live in a place where the mobile device is your primary means of access, then it is a problem because you may have created an account and you have no option to delete it. Um, so here are some examples where you can delete accounts um, on these mobile apps. Uh, you can't delete accounts using the mobile apps for YouTube and Instagram, but you can create accounts on mobile. And then we did see that there are manifestations of what we would think are dark patterns. The first kind of dark pattern we noted is something called obstruction, which makes something harder than it needs to be. So here we had cases where in order to delete your account, you have to go through a series of confirmatory emails, or perhaps have to navigate to something that's totally outside the normal social media interface. Um, sometimes you have to be faced with confirm shaming, um, like here, are you sure you want to delete with a big sad face? Or no, I changed my mind. Or a lot of added friction. For example, on LinkedIn, um, again, it would be, Jane, we're so sorry to see you go and you know, sort of make you jump through many hoops to keep you on the platform. Interestingly, when one of the students working on the project tried to delete her LinkedIn account, which had a lot of history on it, she actually experienced many more obstructive steps and hoops that she had to jump, jump through before getting to the option where she could delete her account. She didn't actually delete her account in the end. But that just showed us that clean profiles, again, this may be a lower bound. The other dark pattern we noted was so-called immortal accounts. So, Half of the platforms we looked at had unclear language on what account-related information is retained. So for example, Instagram says, data will be removed, inaccessible to other Quora users, or will no longer be viewable on Twitter. Well, what does that really mean? Who really has access to that? And when will it actually be deleted? And similarly, in a related vein, some of the platforms also have this dark pattern called force continuity, where here, um, if a user is seeking to delete their account on a particular platform, other users on the platform can still engage with their content um, during this deletion process. So for example, on Facebook, your Facebook post will still be visit visible to other users during the forced period of closure before your account is actually deleted. So once we figured out that dark patterns seem to be prevalent in social media account deletion, uh, we actually wanted to find out what people like yourself, you know, thought about the account deletion process on social media. So we conducted a survey with 300 social media users in the US, and we saw that there were, you know, roadblocks in the deletion process. Um, there was a lot of deletion abandonment. 
So 64% of our survey respondents had deleted a social media account in the past, but two thirds managed to successfully delete and the others, 47% changed their mind. It happens. 17% couldn't find the deletion option and 16% said they just gave up because the process was too onerous. In, one word, in the words of one participant, sometimes they make it harder to find than it needs to be. Many people were also confused about the different deletion options um, and also confused about what happens to their data after account deletion and when exactly deletion happens. Users wanted privacy, but they also did want to prevent accidental deletion. And they had mixed feelings on what data should be retained and for how long. So the major takeaways here are that account deletion options language really needs to be more consistent. And account deletion outcomes for users should really be clarified in the language that social media platforms use. For example, people like you and I need to know, well, who has access to our data? What is retained if I'm deleting it? What are the timeframes involved? And really, we need to have more discussion around what is a dark pattern in the space and what is necessary friction to prevent things like accidental deletion. So there is relevant legislation here in the space to actually protect consumers. So in the European Union, there's the General Data Regulation Protection Act. Um, there's also the more, uh, the newer Digital Services Act, which is coming into play. And in the US, we have the California Consumer Privacy Act and the California Privacy Rights Act, which is going to sort of amend and extend um, that act. And there are different states that are trying to sort of think about dark patterns and how to protect consumers when um, these kinds of online manipulations are happening. Um, relatedly, there also has been a new bill introduced um, called the Kids Online Safety Act, where again, uh, lawmakers are thinking about how to prevent dark patterns, even in streaming media platforms where, you know, kids, for example, might be kept on a platform by things like autoplay and so on. So while there are these regulations, there's still a lot of need um, for further research in this space so that we can actually uh, legislate on this and uh, actually protect consumers from things, you know, harms. So enforcement does incur. Um, the Federal Trade Commission that oversees consumer protections uh, for the US, uh, online consumer protections, actually has taken uh, different service providers to task. So in 2021, they went after abcmouse.com. Um, this was an app for kids where you can learn your ABCs and so on. And they um, you know, went after them because they said that they didn't make it clear or easy for people to cancel a subscription. So people were ending up paying subscription transfers, which were renewing without their consent. And then more recently, um, the Federal Trade Commission actually went after another company this year, um, Vonage, which is for making internet uh, calls over the internet. And they actually uh, said again that Vonage made it really hard for users to get out of this, including adding fees uh, that they didn't disclose when people signed up for Vonage for early termination. So in future work, what our lab is trying to do is really to take more measurements, to use and create more tools to collect data, and also to understand how to deal with this misleading online information, uh, what kinds of tools users need, to identify these kinds of patterns, or even to educate themselves about these kinds of patterns. And this would include more experiments and studies on user reactions to dark patterns. And especially, you know, for some users, it may be harder and, uh, for them to sort of become aware of or easier for them to be manipulated by certain dark patterns. So for example, um, you know, certain dark patterns may affect older adults differently than they affect children or adults. And so particularly for marginalized users, there's a need to actually study this. And of course, we need to raise awareness. So I'm really glad that you came to this talk today. Maybe you've learned a bit about dark patterns and you can tell people that you know 
but really we need more ways to educate the public about these kinds of online manipulations so that the public can actually report when things don't feel right or when they feel like um, something's being done that is actually deceptive or um, you know, uh, is manipulative in some way. So that's where I'd like to conclude my formal presentation remarks. And before I do, I just want to say thank you so much. Um, in academia, we're never just uh, an island and also we never get projects like this done uh, without the help of many collaborators and many amazing students. And so I'd love to just thank my collaborators um, and students that were involved in this project, um, these many projects, and then also our funders. And also thank, um, uh, thank you all for joining. And then I'd also like to welcome Katie Bailey uh, to the floor because Katie will be helping us to moderate the Q&A discussion. Thank you, Marshani, uh, for that fascinating lecture. So interesting to learn about something we interact with every day and certainly timely during this um, shopping season. So first and foremost, what can we do as consumers? How can we combat these dark patterns? How can we help be smarter when interacting and seeing these leading uh, messages and buttons that you just discussed? Well, I think as consumers, um, what we can do is when we do notice something and, and, and feel like it is uh, causing financial harm or distress, et cetera, um, we need to speak up. So the Federal Trade Commission that I mentioned actually has a reporting mechanism on their website, for example, where you can actually report deceptive practices. And so um, bringing this to the attention of you know, regulatory bodies or bodies like Truth in Advertising and these kinds of non-profits uh, as well, this really is helpful because without evidence, it's really hard for anyone to you know, um, try to stop the manipulative practices of any particular service provider unless they have evidence of real consumer harm. And so I think that's one thing that consumers can do. Um, second, I just think consumers could just educate themselves and maybe, you know, particularly in online shopping, um, just take a moment to reflect, <laughs> you know, um, as we're heading into the holiday season, again, uh, you know, maybe just try not to be as impulsive, uh, see and think about, you know, what are you really being shown, maybe look on, on multiple sites and so on. Um, and then again, in the social media space, you know, it's hard to sort of address that from a consumer point of view. Um, I think, again, this is where regulation comes into, into play. But really, I think educating yourself and your friends, uh, that would be great so that other people are not taken in uh, by potentially harmful practices. Um, maybe you could talk a little bit more about regulation. Um, why does consumer protection regulation matter in this space? And do you think we need to do more at the federal level? Um, I do think that... Um, the regulations matter in this space. So for example, I mentioned that um, California has um, the California Consumer Privacy Act and also the California Privacy Rights Act. And so although it may seem strange to just refer to one state's legislation, the nice thing about California enacting the strong legislation um, that covers uh, things like the right to delete your data, um, to know about what data is collected about you and so on, is that it can have a knock-on effect where other states or other, um, you know, to comply with that California law, online service providers have to actually make sure that they're um, providing those, uh, those needed rights for consumers. And that means that they have to think about, well, if they're providing it for Californians, do they provide it for all of the people on their site? And then it also has the knock-on effect of if one state is doing it, um, some states might look to that as a state as an example and also enact their own laws. Um, so at the federal level, I did mention that the Federal Trade Commission, um, it does oversee online consumer protections at that level and can actually um, look into deceptive practices more generally, whether that's dark patterns or deceptive advertising and so on. So I think regulation is important because uh, by making these laws, you can actually see uh, how um, how consumers can be protected and also like what providers do in response to these laws. So in another re related research study, that's actually what we're looking into. We want to see um, 
how do these laws actually affect what online service providers do and how do they actually provide um, those Californian protections to Californians and what do they do for everyone else? Um, do you foresee online platforms using your data to try to make their practices even more deceptive? So I think there's two sides to the coin of how we can be smarter as consumers, but then does can that data also be used by companies to say, oh, okay, there's other ways we can try to be, you know, kind of further embed these dark patterns? Right. I mean, I'd say with any research, there's always the possibility that your research uh, may be used in a way you didn't intend. Um, I'd say with the deceptive practices, I mean, uh, deceptive practices online are, they are illegal. So um, I would say, even if a company does use this data to sort of adopt these tactics, um, what they're doing isn't in compliance with guidelines and the law. And so they're just putting themselves at risk. So from my point of view, you know, even if that was the outcome, um, at least I know that, you know, those people could, face consequences for doing that. Um, and, you know, a follow up question, then I know like Apple and other providers have tried to do more to limit tracking. And how, you know, have you seen that affect how companies are utilizing dark patterns? Or has there been a change in the value of some of this tracking data if it's not as exhaustive as it once was? Um. I, I wouldn't say that. I mean, I think there are many different things um, that come into play with that question. Um, in terms of privacy, I think data is always very valuable. I, I think Apple, because they control the App Store, does um, mean that, like, you know, if you want to have your app in the App Store, you are forced to abide by their privacy policies. And so that has created some, I guess, roadblocks for some companies. Um, but I don't think it has changed the underlying value of the data. Um, I do think that dark patterns can also be related to privacy, uh, but again, without the results of the most recent research I'm doing, um, it's hard to say uh, exactly, you know, what the effects are specific to privacy. Um, and do our, you know, the extensive use of our phones, do our phones amplify these dark patterns, particularly with social media notifications, things like that? Um, and all of the you know, apps on our phones, does that allow companies to track our activity on other sites more readily? Yeah, so I mean, I think um, some of the dark patterns may be exacerbated on a mobile device. So in a related group of studies on Netflix, um, we're looking at how Netflix presents recommendations to you. And so um, Netflix, you know, when they have their own Netflix created original content, um, you know, when you're browsing that content on a mobile phone, the thumbnails that you're shown for the Netflix originals are actually bigger than the thumbnails for um, other content that Netflix didn't create. So even something like that as a small change, it's not necessarily a, I would say like, um, you know, whether that's a dark pattern or not remains to be seen, but it is some sort of interface design that's designed to, again, make you notice the Netflix original more. So because of the screen, screen real estate, I think the mobile device does, you know, can exacerbate dark patterns. And then, like I said, in some cases, if um, dark patterns manifest on mobile devices, um, they can affect a lot of people. So I'm from South Africa. Uh, many people in South Africa are mobile only. That, that is a primary means of accessing the internet. And so for those users, if they can't delete a social media account on a mobile device, you're basically saying they just can't delete an account. And so I think, again, you know, it is kind of exacerbated on mobile. Interesting. Thank you. Um, in your data collection, particularly with the shopping websites and the airlines, like you mentioned, did you see price changes ever with revisiting a website where it saw that you were there, maybe you viewed a particular airline route, and then suddenly the price was a little bit cheaper to try to get you to make that purchase? So that was not the focus of our research, um, price discrimination, but I do know that it is a subject of research. Um, I know, for example, a student in one of my classes was very interested in that um, and felt that there was price discrimination going on uh, when they were abroad on certain sites that they looked at. So specifically in our data set, I cannot speak to that, but I, I think that as far as I know, it is something that um, others are looking into. 
Um, and again, with airlines, you know, you mentioned so many tickets left at this price. Do we have evidence that that is um, fictitious? Uh, I assume airlines wouldn't volunteer that necessarily, but right. you know, we can uh, kind of. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I mean, I think in the airline case, that was just an example I threw in because, you know, I really want to be in Key West <laughs> for two weeks. But. Um, you know, there's no, like, I wasn't trying to suggest that there's evidence that they are necessarily being deceptive. I was more suggesting that when you see these kinds of notifications, in some cases, it does make you question or um, want to know more about what information does the provider have that you don't, and whether what you think that means is the same as what the provider thinks it means, and whether there's deception. So those things are unclear. Um, in the airline space, I think it is complicated. Um, you know, I know airlines oversell tickets and so on. So again, I wouldn't be comfortable saying that they are being deceptive, but I can definitely say in the shopping space, um, you know, from our data set, you know, the things that I mentioned are examples of deceptive practices. And some are just examples of practices that may be dark patterns, even if they're not necessarily deceptive. Um. So you talked extensively about dark patterns on shopping and social media sites. Are there other places where these dark patterns show up on the internet? Yes. So um, I mentioned, you know, streaming media. So we've been looking into Netflix, so subscription video on demand platforms, and looking to see if there are deceptive practices there. So one example um, that we sort of asked users about in a user study was about autoplay. So this is where maybe you're watching a piece of content on Netflix or um, another subscription video on demand platform, and it gives you some sort of countdown, and then the next piece of content automatically starts playing. And we were interested to see, you know, is this um, kind of taking away the choice from you to decide whether to watch more? Does it lead to binge watching? Um, does it make you feel less in control of your time or even the content that you're watching? And our initial evidence is that um, users do kind of feel, the people we spoke to did feel that they're less in control of their time and less in control of uh, um, the content they watch because of things like autoplay. But at the same time, you know, sometimes they're okay with that because they're sitting down to be entertained. And sometimes it causes negative effects like losing sleep, um, has effects on mental health. They don't have time to even reflect on what they've just watched because the next episode is starting. And so I, I do think, yes, dark patterns happen in streaming video on demand platforms. Other people have researched dark patterns in games with things like loot boxes, um, paying to, to play and so on. So what I'm speaking about is a phenomenon that happens um, in many different domains online. And I've just given you some examples of domains that they could manifest in. And, and what role do ads and even the ability to skip ads on streaming platforms? Is that another mechanism for either, you know, feeding particular material to an audience or um, another potential dark pattern on, on these services that we interact with? Right. So um, paying to skip ads and so on, I, I can't speak exactly about that. What I can speak to you about is we have um, investigated, I gave you that DJ Khaled example, um, where someone isn't disclosing that they're doing advertising in effect. And we have done studies into that. And so we've looked at um, influencers on YouTube and tried to see um, how many influencers who are doing a type of marketing called affiliate marketing, where they include links to products they talk about in the videos, in their video descriptions, um, how often they're doing this, but not disclosing that they're doing it. The reason being is that the Federal Trade Commission requires that you disclose if you are doing this kind of marketing. And what we found is, again, um, you know, at least I think 10% of the, the people on YouTube, it might be 7 to 10%, they don't disclose that they're doing, oh no, they do disclose, and, and not all of them disclose that they're doing this kind of advertising. And in that space, um, you know, we have seen that users can't always tell even when someone is disclosing that they're advertising, depending on the language that they're using, that it is an ad. For example, if you say um, affiliate links present, what does that mean? <laughs> um, whereas if you say something like, I earn money um, for my channel, if you click the link below, then some people you know, understand that more. And then we've also created tools to help users identify um, videos where affiliate marketing is present. 
So what I can say out of that research is that, yes, disguised ads are a kind of dark pattern and they do affect consumers. But like I said, I, I, I can't speak specifically to the ability to skip ads. So what do you see as the, you know, your ideal goal of your research, your hope for what your um, data will inspire in the way companies use the internet? You know, you mentioned you started out by saying you love the internet. Um, how can we make the internet a better place? And, you know, what would be your goal? We talked a little bit about regulation, but what role does regulation play there? I mean, I think my ultimate goal is just to have my research impact regulations and guide um, how consumers are protected online, as well as just um, also to educate people that these kinds of practices can occur. Um, ultimately, I would like to do more research um, and have uh, us understand more the effects on different kinds of users. So I mentioned older adults, um, children, uh, other marginalized users, or, or people who are even experiencing things like price discrimination. One question Oscar asked about that. And so I think we need more data. And um, I think for me, uh, just having impact with the research on regulation or on education and awareness, like that just makes me really happy. Um, how do I expect platforms to respond to that? I mean, I'd like them to change their practices. I mean, for example, with account deletion, it would be great if they made deletion options um, and the language clear and standardized across the different platforms. Um, just like the regulators in California are saying, you have the right to delete your data, um, it would be nice if this was easier to find, for example, on different websites, and just easier to know what you can expect when you are deleting your account, regardless of the site. And so I think that's where regulation comes into play, because when they say you have the right to delete your data, what it means is that anyone who's operating in California um, has to be able to delete their data on any platform that operates there, right? And that means that websites have to comply because even if they aren't complying, someone could report them, they could be fined and so on. And so I think that's where regulation comes into play is that it's very important to have that protection for users as well as mechanisms for users to report when these deceptive practices are occurring. Um, and you know, I'm hoping that all of these things working in conjunction help to make the internet a better place. Well, thank you so much, Professor Chetty, again, for your presentation and for answering all of our questions. I appreciate it. And with that, I will pass it back to Matt for some closing remarks. Thank you. Well, thank you, Professor Chetty, for sharing your research and knowledge with us. And, and Katie, thank you for extending the conversation with our audience. While I have a moment, I want to take the opportunity to encourage all you Chicago alumni to consider ways they might engage as volunteer leaders in our diverse community of graduates. As we've heard tonight, you Chicago faculty are certainly active in pushing the boundaries of knowledge in a variety of fields. However, in a real sense, the university is also made up of our unique and talented alumni whose volunteer efforts have contributed greatly to the lives of current students, to the city of Chicago, and to our larger world. I hope you consider joining us and adding your voice and your efforts to the work of your fellow alums. I'm certain you'll find it as rewarding and inspiring as I have. And there are lots of ways to engage or re-engage with you, Chicago. Once again, thank you to Dr. Chetty and to all of you for coming together to celebrate the University of Chicago community. <laughs>